so uh, Eleanor Byrne is a doctoral student in the philosophy department at the University of York uh, with interests in the philosophy of medicine, psychiatry, and phenomenology. Um, she is also an administrator on an AHRC funded project on grief. Um, the title of her talk today is Striking the Balance with Epistemic Injustice. Thanks, Winnie. Um, can everybody see the slides that I've shared? Okay, is that coming up? Yeah, fab. All right, so um, it's nice to be here today. Um, and it's also nice to see that some of the things that I want to talk about today um, are nicely complemented by some of the things that have already been discussed. So um, thanks to people that have spoken so far for kind of helping me understand my ideas and kind of in different terms. Um, so this talk, when this conference was originally supposed to run, was a work in progress. Um, it's now not but I've added some kind of newer thoughts towards the end that um, I'm kind of still working through. So it'd be great to get some feedback on, on those bits. Um, so in overview, um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, epistemic injustice and just how difficult finding that balance is when we're talking about introducing this concept to um, medical students. So, um, I want to illuminate some tensions that can arise when we're trying to find that balance between taking steps to prevent against epistemic injustice um, and trying to understand the complexity of um, the predicament that patients uh, are in. So my general uh, view here is that we need nuance and we need care when we're trying to warn against epistemic injustice um, in trainee clinicians as to avoid obfuscating lines of inquiry that might be quite revealing. So, um, and I think attending to this is imperative when we're trying to introduce the concept of epistemic injustice to medical education. So um, I'm gonna talk mostly about um, chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, which is um, what I focused on uh, in the paper. Um, but I'm gonna end by talking a little bit about long COVID as a kind of new relevant um, example here or case in point. So uh, first for those of you that, that aren't familiar with CFSME, so um, this is a incredibly poorly understood condition. Um, there's a lot of kind of politics around it. Um, there's a lot of contention as well. So um, the World Health Organization classed it as a neurological condition in the 80s, but um, there's been some kind of, uh, some schools of thought um, that want to classify it as a psychiatric, psychiatric condition um, and so on. So it's very unsettled and, and gets quite heated. So um, the symptomatology is highly heterogeneous, um, but is typically characterized as, um, as well as fatigue uh, that isn't uh, eased by rest. Uh, we've got post-exertional malaise, which is um, kind of exhaustion following uh, very minimal sometimes amounts of physical exercise, uh, sleep problems, muscle joint pain, headaches, uh, flu-like symptoms, feeling dizzy or sick or having heart palpitations. So really super broad range of symptoms there. Um, it's worth noting that some people have tried to uh, separate CFS and ME. Um, and maintain that they're, they're separate conditions. Um, it's a plausible hypothesis, but a lot more work needs to be done. Um, so for just to be in line with current research, I'll say CFS, uh, ME. So um, I guess everybody's familiar with what we mean by epistemic injustice by now. Um, there's been uh, some nice explanations of it so far today. So as we know broadly, um, epistemic injustice occurs when one's harmed in their capacity as a knower. So um, Ian Kidd, who is here today, I believe, um, has developed this really nice notion of pathocentric epistemic injustices. So they're ones that target ill people in particular. Um, so we've still got, um, as was mentioned earlier, our kind of testimony injustice and our hermeneutical injustice. So where testimonial injustice um, leads to compromised credibility because of somebody being a member of a particular group um, and hermeneutic injustice, which is where there are inadequate conceptual resources for understanding one's experience. So this could mean various things, right? We could have 
Uh, we could not have those resources for whatever reason, or we could have them, um, but we don't attend to them properly, so they, they lack uptake. Um, so a nice paper by uh, Ian and Javi Carell, uh, they talk about uh, exactly these issues um, and discuss how, so the relationship between clinician and patient is not inevitably unjust, but it's structured in certain ways that make these injustices more likely to occur than they would otherwise. Um, and so examples that we're familiar with at this point um, are kind of presumptive attributions of, of negative uh, personality traits um, in people who are ill, prime example being emotional instability. So um, a little bit of background about how, in my view, this relates to CFS ME. So I think there's loads of legitimate concern about the treatment of CFS ME patients. Um, and it, it seems uncontroversially true that they do experience um, low credibility or unfairly low credibility for various reasons. And I think one of the, the main reasons here is a lack of known biomarkers. So there's no sort of physiological dysfunction, if you like, that can be identified um, that's seen as kind of proof of the, of the, dysfun of the dysfunction. Uh, so there's no kind of blood test or scan or whatever that can reveal the presence of, um, of the dysfunction that gives rise to the illness. Um, it's diagnosed by exclusion. Uh, and usually as a last resort. So um, a nice paper recently by Charlotte Blees and, and others um, focused on CFSME and epistemic injustice um, and highlighted this uh, negative stereotyping that can take place. Um, nice quote from the paper being, uncertainty about the condition translates into uncertainty about its sufferers. Um, moreover, another study uh, looked at views of trainee physicians and found that um, a significant number of them had negative views about CFSME and understood it as just tiredness or tiredness plus. So um, it's worth noting this is one reason why people can sometimes be uh, unsure about the label CFS. So chronic fatigue syndrome suggests that fatigue is the, is the principal symptom, but really if you Kind of if you ask people and um, find out what their most debilitating symptoms are, um, it's not always uh, the fatigue. So things like uh, light sensitivity or um, muscle pain or joint pain can sometimes be the kind of um, defining characteristics of somebody's illness. Um, <clears throat> so um, another study looked at um, practicing GPs' attitudes towards CFS ME. Um, I got a couple of, of quotes from the GPs on the slide here. So one of them was, if you start labeling a patient, if you're not careful, you might have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Another was, some people like a label, some people like to know what's causing their symptoms, whether it's the truth or not, and some people are looking for a label to attach to their symptoms. Um, now, in the, in the Blease paper, um, they argued that these attitudes are kind of evidence of negative stereotyping. Um, consequently, uh, they concluded this group, that is GPs, um, are at high risk of perpetuating these injustices with their future patients, testimonial injustices that is. And as a result, that's going to exacerbate those hermeneutical gaps that we see that cause so many problems. Um, so I've got two kind of concerns about uh, about this that I'll run through. So the first of those is that um, I think we need to be really careful to recognise the extent of the um, conceptual impoverishment that we're facing with CFSME. So crucially, we need to find that balance between protecting the epistemic status of patients and allowing medical professionals to exercise sensitivity within the given context, the context being vast impoverishment, um, and moreover with CFSME, um, vast etiological heterogeneity. So we know that there's not one cause for CFSME, it's a whole range of things, we need to remain sensitive to that. Um, so I think we need caution when attributing testimonial justice to particular concerns uh, expressed by medical professionals, um, so that we don't 
eclipse one set of legitimate concerns in an attempt to recognise another set of leg legitimate concerns. Um, so we, we don't want to be insufficiently critical when we're um, making claims of epistemic injustice um, and fail to recognise that we're really struggling to know what's going on here. Um, and I think in the long run, we want to be extra careful not to hermeneutically disable patients by doing so. So uh, another worry I've got here is um, the way that epistemic injustice is formulated as a philosophical concept. So um, Miranda Fricker, as we all know, who um, developed the concept in a 2007 book, um, described epistemic injustice as an insult that undermines one's rationality. So she wrote, um, the capacity to give knowledge to others is one side of that many-sided capacity so significant in human beings, namely the capacity for reason. We're long familiar with the idea played out by the history of philosophy in many variations that our rationality is what lends humanity its distinctive value. So I worry a little bit about this um, formulation of epistemic injustice, uh, in the case of CFSME at least. Um, so I think there are two cases that highlight this nicely. Um, so there's a significant number of children with CFSME, sometimes very young children, um, and there's a considerable number of CFSME patients with depression. Seems like we want to be sensitive to the fact that members of those groups will have either not yet fully developed faculties of, of, of reason or um, impairments. Um, and it seems like we want to kind of allow that, recognise it, um, but not deny uh, or not restrict those people's ability to make claims of epistemic injustice, right? Um, that seems important. Um, a couple of slides there that go into more detail if you want to ask me about it in the Q&A, but I'll skip that for now. Um, so I'd like to draw your attention to um, a distinction uh, by American psychiatrist Ronald Pies, which I think is really helpful here. And this is the distinction between respect and credulity. So um, he wrote this in the context of um, how to differentiate between grief and depression. A really, really great paper if you're interested in, in those issues. So um, he, he wrote that um, it's essential that we respect testimony, absolutely. Um, and part of respecting testimony requires that we assess it uh, seriously, seriously and with sensitivity, um, yet crucially be open to the possibility that it, it might not be accurate. So he writes, uh, the patient's own theory of the case may prove to be misleading or incomplete. For example, the patient may be unaware of or ignoring the presence of an underlying medical disorder. Um, and I think this, uh, the importance of recognising this comes out in, in Fricker's own work when she writes about hermeneutical injustice. So she discusses this uh, as um, preventing people from understanding by the patch of experience which is strongly in her interest to understand, for without that understanding she's left troubled, confused and isolated. Um, so at this point um, I'd like to run through a new case which I think is highly relevant here, which is long COVID, unfortunately. Um, so we're seeing uh, a significant number of reports of long COVID um, and it's quite worrying. Um, so obviously the, the research into this is, is new and ongoing where we're far from figuring out what's going on here. Um, but what we've done so far seems to pick out at least four different predicaments um, that are all kind of um, under the label long COVID. So that's uh, first of all, being just um, viral persistence, so having COVID for a really long time. Um, the second of those being um, long-term organ damage as a result of the infection. Um, another being uh, physical trauma from uh, being in ICU. Um, and the other being post-viral fatigue or related syndromes. Um, moreover, another complicated um, factor here is that um, the clinical presentation, as with COVID itself, is hugely diverse. So there doesn't seem to be kind of uh, one presentation that looks like long COVID. It seems like a um, massive, uh, very broad range of, of things. Um, so not everybody who's presenting with long COVID type symptoms, um, which I reiterate is a super broad set of symptoms, um, not all of those people have had a test. 
um, for obvious reasons. I mean, I remember just a few months ago that um, it, it was incredibly difficult to get a test when you needed one. I know a colleague of, of mine at York had to uh, drive uh, their child all the way to North Allerton to get a test, which is hours away. Um, moreover, not everybody that um, had a test uh, had a test that came back positive, um, even though they had very good reason to think that they, they probably were infected with COVID, maybe they were around somebody for a prolonged period of time who, who definitely did have COVID. Um, and research into long COVID is including these people, um, at least most of the stuff that I've seen. So uh, Nisreen Alwan is conducting a big study, study at the minute. She was, uh, or she is one of the people behind um, calling this condition long COVID as a kind of patient made term. She's calling uh, for us to count long COVID. Um, so I think there's very good reason for this. I think it's probably the right thing to do. We don't wanna um, restrict our data set um, too far. Um, when there are obvious reasons why some people are not going to have that positive test result. Um, the problem is though that we need to be then really really careful to try and distinguish long COVID from a range of other predicaments that uh, present incredibly similarly uh, and we need to look at um, why that is. So I think um, a really interesting area of, of work here is to look at contextual factors which um, might dispose people to pursuing a long COVID diagnosis in the first place. Um, so the first of these, um, I think it is uh, the role of stigma. So um, patients are at least better protected um, from certain injustices that are fueled by stigma um, should they receive a long COVID diagnosis over other candidate illnesses that can present uh, incredibly similarly um, so, for example, CFSME, as I've already discussed with you, fibromyalgia, which is a, a related condition, which is um, more so a kind of a pain condition than fatigue, um, uh, and indeed depression with somatic presentation. Um, so I don't want to imply here that um, a long COVID diagnosis uh, protects people from, from stigmas entirely. I think it absolutely doesn't. Um, but... Um, I think the problem is less so with a long COVID diagnosis, at least at this point. Um, and also better than no diagnosis, right? So um, a lot of harms can follow from um, not being able to get any sort of diagnosis, um, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, the second of these um, contextual factors, which I think we need to pay attention to, um, is the epistemic resources that are available to people. So. Um, everybody's heard of long COVID now. So I, I've been working on um, CFSME for uh, three-ish years now. And when people say, oh, what do you work on? They go, what's that? Nobody, nobody knows what it is. And now everyone's going, oh, we heard about long COVID. That's the thing that you do. Um, so people, people are, they have that concept now where they didn't before. Um, they're not, not everybody's making that connection between long COVID and, and CFSME. Um, but again, you just need to go on um, on the Guardian or, or the BBC News page to find um, articles and articles about long COVID. Um, I've been collecting them all uh, as they've been coming out, um, and they're everywhere. Whereas articles about CFSME were not everywhere, and still are not everywhere. So this information is here. This label is here. Um, so. Um, what we've got is a kind of a body of information which people can identify with and recognize. Um, so if their symptoms kind of vaguely fit that long COVID picture, then uh, people are going to be disposed to that narrative, um, especially I think given reports of um, atypical presentations. So there, there isn't kind of one super tight set of symptoms that, that looks like long COVID. Um, but that list of symptoms seems to be ever expanding as with COVID itself, right? At first it, there were the, um, the three main symptoms and then it's uh, it seems to have grown and, and changed as the months have gone by as we've come to learn more about the condition. Um, so how is this relevant um, for medical education? So I think there's two things uh, or two different ways that this can play out and I think that we need to pay attention to um, to these issues. So um, 
if um, as a medical professional you become doubtful that coronavirus has really played any etiological role in uh, in the condition that the patient is presenting with I think it's essential to not dismiss these cases as kind of you know all in their head um, or involving um, any sort of manipulation on the part of the patient um, so in so doing we need to pay attention to um, or pursue rather alternative diagnoses which present or can present very similarly um, and the reasons for pursuing the long COVID diagnosis in the first place. Um, so as I discussed before, um, kind of reduce stigma and epistemic resources, right? Having that label available to you um, where it wasn't before. So most people when um, they end up with a, a CFSME diagnosis have not gone to a GP and said, oh, I, I'm pretty sure I've got CFSME. It's, uh, I don't know what's wrong with me, um, followed by uh, distressing, Few months ahead of well or if you're not kind of palmed off completely um of kind of tests coming back normal um and ending up with the label kind of as a last resort um uh, on the other hand i think um if we are more sure that um the coronavirus has played an etiological role in in the illness um we still need to be careful not to um become narrow in our investigative focus so um, clearly long COVID is not going to permit to monocausal explanation um, just like CFSME so in fact many people with CFSME um, cite viral triggers um, so Epstein-Barr virus is, um, is a kind of prime candidate here um, but it doesn't explain all cases um, uh, a recent paper by Ken Kendler, who's an um, American psychiatrist, I think is super relevant here and very interesting. Um, so he's discussed kind of various trends in how we uh, look for causal explanations in psychiatry and medicine more broadly over uh, the past few decades. Um, and he made the insightful point that um, intervention with uh, causally relevant factors, which and neither necessary nor sufficient can still prevent a significant amount of disease. Um, so we need to be open-minded to all causally relevant factors, not just those ones which are um, sufficient or necessary. Um, so going forward, I think um, the most important thing is working on better accommodating and understanding um, all of these related conditions that uh, are our understanding of is so poor and that present very similarly, uh, especially if we're going to um, commit to the, the project of hermeneutically enabling patients uh, on a deep level, not just superficially. Um, and this requires um, that we retain sensitivity to all causally relevant factors, but crucially, we need to be very careful about how we weight them. So I think we, this is a, a big problem that relates to uh, stigmatization especially of psychiatric illnesses um, that uh, causal factors which implicate psychiatric illness seem to be kind of weighted more heavily than uh, than others so um, polycystic ovary syndrome is a really good example of this so we know that um, insulin resistance um, is a causal factor or causally relevant factor it's definitely not necessary and it's definitely definitely not sufficient um, again, we know that psychological stress is a relevant causal factor. Again, it's neither necessary nor sufficient. But um, pursuing the latter um, as a causal factor, um, we need to be careful how, how much weight we put on those respective causal factors. So emphasizing psychological stress seems to imply, obviously, kind of psychiatric predicaments. And with that, um, because of the, the kind of, you know, the long history of psychiatric, um, the stigmatization of psychiatric illnesses, um, kind of blame, weakness of character, you name it. Um, whereas insulin resistance doesn't seem to carry that. Um, and people seem quite comfortable to say, well, this is, this is a causal factor, but of course it's not the whole picture. Um, so how we, how we weight those causal factors is, um, is I think essential. Um, um, 
so we shouldn't, uh, I don't think, ignore those causal factors. I think we need to pay attention to them and take them very seriously, but be careful about, about what they mean or how we, uh, how we understand them and frame them. Um, so ultimately, um, the point I want to make here is that uh, I think collaboration between what uh, Bill Fulford and, and others referred to as stakeholder groups. So in, in this paper, they wrote, um, the focus of the paper was about psychiatry, but they said that this applies to um, or should apply to medicine more broadly. Um, so stakeholder groups, they defined as anybody who's kind of involved in, in, the, um, in the illness in any way. So um, patients, um, family of patients, um, researchers, um, clinicians and so on. Um, so all of these people need to be um, part of the, the process of understanding um, the relevant conditions. And I think we are seeing something like this with long COVID, which is really nice to see. So there's a lot of patient-led research um, happening at the minute. Um, so I think both patients and um, medical professionals of various types can contribute um, sometimes independently, sometimes collaboratively, over various domains um, of understanding here, um, and that accordingly um, building our understanding of, of these conditions needs to be deeply collaborative. And I think that this um, is complemented nicely by some of the things that have been said so far today about um, epistemic humility. It was not a term I'm kind of used to using, but um, it's nice to see some kind of similar perspectives on that. Um, so that's all I've got to say about that. Um, I've got the, the papers that I spoke about here as well, if anybody's interested. Thanks. Thanks so much, Elena.